Hello everyone and welcome to Funk Prog Sweden at Funnel. Yay! <laughs> this time we're actually in Funnel, so we have people here sitting and watching live. And we also have people on the stream watching from everywhere in the world. So welcome everyone, both here in the room and on internet. So, the agenda. I will do a short intro. Then uh, Johan Viren will present a little bit what Funnel is doing. And then we'll have Odo over to Circular, Circular Reasoning in Haskell by Tom. And Tom has promised us to show how you do go to and break in Haskell. Yeah, it's a really good feature, I think, in Haskell. Yes. <laughs> and then in the end, we'll have a summary. Yeah. So. First up, I would like to say thanks to Funnel for again, third time around, having us as a guest here. And to tell and present a little bit what Funnel is doing, we, Johan Viren from Funnel will come and present a little bit. So welcome, Johan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Johan Viren. I work here at Funnel as a software developer. And Funnel, we really, really like uh, marketing data here at Funnel. So we provide a platform where marketers can make use of their data. And we provide tons of integrations for getting data into Funnel and also out of Funnel. We are around 300 people now, and we have offices in Stockholm, Boston, and Dublin. And we work in small self-managed teams. So if anything like this sounds interesting to you, then I say that you should go to our career site at jobs.funnel.io because we are hiring. Thank you very much. And now over to Tom. Yeah. Can you just let it be? Yeah. Then we'll continue. Uh, next, we would also like to thank our video sponsor, Adavit. Again, thanks for sponsoring this stream. If you want to know more about Adabit, check them out on their webpage, adabit.com. I also do a little bit of advertising for the coming meetups. We'll have another meetup, 8th of November, then 6th of December. Then we're back again next year, 17th of January. And then we'll run, as always, at least once per month. And if you want to support the community, of, and which of course you want to do, you head over to the Meetup community and join. Uh, you subscribe on the channel. And if you're a hardcore fan, you get a t-shirt like this from the shop, which you really should do. And I also want to do a shout out to our thousand member on the Meetup page, Bruno Parga. He asked for a, like, a, yeah. He said, like, will I get a golden lambda? No, you'll get a shout out. That's it. <laughs> Sorry, no more. Um, then, if you have questions during the presentation in this room, please wait for the mic. If you're online, please write in the chat and I will read it up for the present presenter. Yes, that's it. Then, let's start. Welcome up, Tom. Now comes the most, now, yeah, now we find out. always the trickiest part. Will it work? It worked <laughs> before. Can it work now? We never know. It's Pray always to the speaking gods. Yes, we hope for the best. Ooh, it works. Good. Easy to please. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, let's let's see. Oh yeah, look, that works. So I've, I've, uh, I will start with some caveats. Um, I have been told to stand here because that's where the cameras are. I have a nice, uh, nasty habit while talking of jumping around and dancing and pointing at things. So if I do that, please sort of violently wave me back to this point. Um, that would be useful. Um, so yes, circular reasoning in Haskell. Um, my name is Tom. Uh, this is my Twitter handle. And I work at a company called Hasora. This is one of our little mascots. Um, and the reason I wanted to talk today was because we have some, uh, some problems that I think are quite interesting. So we, uh, we take your back-end data sources, be it 
Postgres, BigQuery, GraphQL APIs, whatever. And we aggregate all of that behind one unified GraphQL API. And so if you want to query one of those databases, you do it through a GraphQL query. You can query across multiple databases. It's all very clever. We're hiring, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the thing that I find really interesting about this problem is, uh, is the graph side of uh, GraphQL. Um, so if we, if we take, let me just make my notes a bit bigger. If we take this, this is some classic code, right? This is nothing uh, we haven't. Oh, uh, before, I, before I get too into it, uh, show of hands, who in the room knows any Haskell at all? Good. Oh, fantastic. Who knows quite a lot? Good. OK. <laughs> Good. No, this is perfect. So this is Haskell. Um, <laughs> surprise. Uh, so this is, this is my example of some, some uh, contrived user table where users are things that have uh, names and some friends. Isn't that nice? Um, and Alice is one such user, and she has two friends called Bob and Carol. Um, What's interesting about this and, and the intuition I want to build is this is very much like a tree shape. So we have Alice at the top, and children of Alice are Bob and Carol. And for as long as data looks like this, where we have this nice tree shape where something has sub things and so on, everything's very easy. Um, but one of your immediate concerns here might be, well, what if Alice is Bob's friend too? What if Bob has any friends at all? Um, what if, what if we should all try a little harder to love ourselves? Um, so what we want to do is we want to take this example, and we want Alice to be a friend of Bob. Well, if we were writing JavaScript, apologies to anyone in the room who writes TypeScript. This is the first and last TypeScript I will ever be writing. Uh, this, is, this is Bob. And what we do is we create Bob without friends, bless him. And then later on, we mutate Bob by adding himself as a friend. So the, the point I want to make here is the way we build a graph in mutable languages is we mutate a value we've already made. We declare it, and then later we, we tie the knot. We sort of link something back to itself. Um, and we have a problem in Haskell, which is it's a purely functional language. It has uh, no concept, purely, of mutations. Once you create a value, that's it forever. If I say this thing is 2, I can't change my mind and say it's 3 later. And so if I make Bob and then try to mutate it, the, the compiler gets very cross at me. So the question becomes, how do I represent Bob as a person who is friends with himself in Haskell? So your first guess, um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're new or alternatively a Haskell veteran, is to cram in some mutable state and say that in Haskell we have sort of IO refs, which are things we've explicitly said are mutable. And so this is basically an exact copy of what we just saw in JavaScript, which is friends is a, is a mutable list that we start off by saying is empty. We create a temporary version of Bob in which he has no friends. And then we write himself to his list of friends at the end, and we get it back. This is, this is fine. There's nothing uh, inherently wrong with this. But there are a couple problems. And the big one is that now we have this ugly IO thing here. And anyone who's ever done anything with Haskell will know that you can't you can't get rid of that once it's there. Once you say this is I.O., you've, you've lost uh, the purity, and everything that touches it has to become I.O., and it, it spreads everywhere like a, like a terrible mess. So what we'd like is a way in Haskell of avoiding this mess, a way of building uh, cycles in graphs without using mutable state. Um, and it turns out the way you do it in Haskell uh, is this. You just say, Carol is Carol's friend, and, and it sort of works, uh, which is good, because in GHC, you can say a value is de defined in terms of itself. So that's the whole talk. We've done it. We've, we've, uh, we've made cyclical data structures in Haskell. Um, but you might, you, you might be uh, dissatisfied with this, and you might wonder, how does that actually work in practice? What's, what's going on here? Um, and so if we, if we think a little bit about what Haskell does at runtime, we have this concept called laziness, which is if you tell me to do something, I won't do it, but I'll remember what it was that you asked. And when you need to know what the answer is, then I will run it. So an interesting way of viewing this, if you're not super familiar with Haskell, is it works a lot like 
wrapping every value in a promise. It's like, I, I don't necessarily have the answer yet, but when you ask for it, I'll block until I figure it out, and then we'll put it back in. So in this case, um, when we say that Carol is Carol's friend, at this point, we don't actually have a definition of Carol, but later on we will, because as soon as we get past that, we'll know who Carol is, and we can, we can tie the knot. The important thing here is that this only works, and we'll see some examples later, if in the middle of that, you don't need to know who Carol is, because if you do, compiler explodes. And spoiler alert, the, the rest of this talk is blowing up the compiler by doing that. So here are some other, I think, quite neat examples. Um, the list of all positive numbers is one, followed by one more than the list of all positive numbers. So it's one, followed by one more than one, followed by one more than one more than one, followed blah, 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 blah. So, I mean, you know, this is, uh, in, in most non-lazy languages, this would hang forever. You'd, you'd never get to the end of this. But in Haskell, when you say map plus one over all the positive numbers, you don't do it, you just remember how to do it. And then when someone asks for the next positive number, you figure out just enough to give them the answer. Um, similarly, there's a very neat definition of Fibonacci, which is if I tell you the first two numbers are 0 and 1, then I can zip the whole Fibonacci sequence with everything but the first one. And so the third one would be 0 plus 1, and the fourth one would be 1 plus whatever 0 plus 1 is, so on and so forth. So there are some nice examples here um, that I think, uh, I think demonstrate how this works quite nicely, in that as long as we have a way to progress towards success, Haskell will sort of figure everything out and tie the knots together. The problem re-emerges uh, when we start talking about effects. So effects in Haskell, um, what we mean is anything that comes with the value. So in this case, this function is friends with, takes a string, a list of users, and returns a user. But some IO happens when, when that is done. In this case, it welcomes the user. It says, please welcome whoever it is, and returns them. So here we build up another graph. Um, Alice is friends with Bob. Bob is friends with Alice. Carol is friends with herself. Good for Carol. And then we print them all out at the end. And if you run this in GHC, you get an error, which is sad. But in, in my head, this is the error I expected the first time around, which is I don't know who Bob is on the line where I talk about Alice, because it hasn't happened yet. So the question is, um, how do we Firstly, do we understand the problem? The, the problem is I can't talk about things in the future. The reason I can't is because I don't know that something in between isn't important, specifically in the way it's ordered. So if I'm writing a bunch of stuff to the console, I want them to come out in the order I said they should write. So I can't start skipping ahead looking for references that might come in the future. I have to run everything in order. And because something might happen between me saying Alice is friends with Bob, i.e. we'll say, welcome Alice, we get stuck because Bob isn't a thing we understand yet. Um, so how do we fix this in Haskell? And the answer is we take the code, which is this, you all remember, and we do this. Did, did anyone notice the fix here? Um, I'll do it again real quick, and then it becomes obvious. So all we do is we change do, which is the Haskell's way of avoiding learning category theory into mdo, which is the Haskell's way of avoiding learning all the other types of maths, I guess. So what mdo says at an uh, intuition level is, forget that whole thing I said about things having to be in order. As long as you mention it somewhere in this block, you can refer to it here. Um, so effectively, the thing we did at the beginning with building the cyclical carol, um, we can now do over I.O. It's not super important to understand how this works, but if you're, if you're interested and hanging on, this is syntactic sugar over a thing called monad fix. And what monad fix does is say, if you give me a function that takes an input and produces an output, I'll give the output as its input, um, which is <laughs> a lot, in my brain at least. So if we take this state example, we take the initial state, we run the computation, given this A with that state, and as a result, we get A, and now we have the input. So we, we run the program, and we take its output, feed it in as an input. This is where it gets weird. 
Um, for, for me, the, the ugliest yet also weirdly the most uh, intuitive example of this comes with IO's mfix, which I've called fix IO. That's a typo. That should say mfix. What we do is we create a mutable variable, and in it, we store a runtime error that says, you shouldn't have done this. We then read that variable um, with unsafe interleave IO. Unsafe interleave IO means only do this when I want it, when I ask for it specifically. So this is how we introduce laziness back into IO. Um, and at that point, we take the value we just read out of that, and we run the function on it, and whatever result we get, we put that in the mutable variable. So big brain stuff. Um, let's get to a, an example, and hopefully this will start making sense. So um, oh, yes, this is how that desugars. So if we don't use the mdo, it looks like this. This, to me, is, is a dreadful eyesore. So I am just going to write mdo. And if you are interested in this, um, you're braver than I am. And have fun translating that in your head. So what can we do with this? Um, here is a function. And it takes a list of doubles. I have to use the cursor. I'm not allowed to dance across the stage. It takes a list of doubles. And it compares each one to this reference double and tells you whether all of them are greater than or less than this number. Um, while doing that, it also builds up the sum of those numbers and the number of numbers we see. So to the, to the keen-eyed among you, you might notice that what we're doing here is building the components to figure out the average of those numbers. So it's wise uh, at this point to say, well, can we take the average of the list and use that as a reference? If we did this in another language, the way we might approach this is say, we'll go through the list once and figure out the average, and then we'll go back through and compare every number to the average. Not, not in Haskell, um, because we have mfix. We can feed the output, the total and count, as the input, the reference. Um, so if we look at how we might uh, write that, we say, we'll compare and collect with the average, which is total divided by count. And then that'll give us the outputs and the total and count. Everyone's scratching their heads. Good, it's working. So what's happening here and why does it work? The important thing is, if you look at this code, the comparison between the input and the reference is entirely separate to building up the total and the count. These are unrelated things that happen in different places independently. So what Haskell does is say, I don't need to know the answer to compare input reference yet. So I'm not going to look at reference, and I'm going to wait until someone asks for it. Meanwhile, we keep building up the state. We build up the sum and the total, uh, sorry, the total and the count. And then when we get to here, when we get to the end of it, we have the total and the count. We can then feed that back through. So now we have the reference. And bear in mind, nothing yet has asked for the average. So when we come to print it, we've already been through, added up the total and the count, divided them, fed it back through tied the knot. What a mess. So the point here is Haskell's laziness works by saying, if, if you don't specifically ask for something, so for example, if you don't print it on the screen, I'm not going to do it yet. I'm going to wait as long as possible and hope that by the time you want it, you've told me everything you need to figure out what this value should be. Um, this is a very powerful feature, because you can talk about things that don't exist yet. It's also a huge foot gun. Um, if, you, if you get this wrong, if in the middle of this function you decided to print the reference, this would hang forever. This, this wouldn't give you any errors, because that's not, <laughs> that's not what Haskell does. Um, it will just break, and it will, it will hang forever, and it will get stuck in a loop, because you've asked for reference, which means it's got to go and figure out where reference came from which means it needs to know the total and count, which you don't know yet. So there's a real delicate dance here, um, which if you, if you get into the libraries of this, as a library author, you make a real effort to hide this, because it's, it's so temperamental. And actually, the example we'll come to at the end, um, it took me a full day to figure out what was wrong, and it was exactly this, because I'd forced something at the wrong point. So it's. I'm not saying this is a good idea. I'm just saying this is a feature of the language. Um, but if you'll bear with me, what if we did consider this a good idea? And we said, uh, 
what's a bad idea look like if, if that's what, what a good idea looks like? Can we, can we make something substantially worse and, uh, and worsen everyone's headache in the room? So we've, we've seen an example which, you know, joking aside, I can traverse a list of any length in, in one go rather than two. There is potentially a use case for this. It is potentially important. Um, so, you know, that's, that's rubbish. How do we misuse it for talk content? And, and the answer is we come back to state, which is, a, which is a thing that if this is new to you, state describes a stateful operation in Haskell. So we go from having some initial state and we do something to produce a value and an updated state. So if you're familiar with uh, front-end world, like Redux or the Elm architecture, this is your update function. This is what that models, is I have my initial state, and I produce a new state by doing something. Um, if you don't know what monads are, that's fine too. The important thing here is the way we string two state operations together is we take the initial state, run it through the first action to get the second state, and run it through the third action the second action to get the third state. So the state just sort of gets chained through all the stateful things from start to finish. Um, and at this point, you might ask, <laughs> why is there that gap after the word monad? And that's because you could fill it with fix. And if you did that, you could say, instead of running the state through the first one and then the second, what happens if I run it through the second one and then the first? And I trust that GHC will sort of figure out what I want to do. Um, and the answer is it does, <laughs> which, is, uh, which is phenomenal. So uh, this, is, uh, this is get and modify for the, the classic uh, state type and also the backward state type. Um, it's funny, my parents just moved to Wales. And when I was writing this the first time, I thought they looked like Welsh words. And now I'm here and I've been here a couple of days. I'm really worried they're Swedish swear words or something. So if, if, I'm sorry uh, if they are. Um, no, no harm intended. So the important thing here is get says, I have this initial state. Uh, I want to return the state and n don't update the state, basically. And modify says, I have this function that does something to the state. So I want to run that on the state and return nothing. And these are the two operations that are useful. And if they're running top to bottom, then if I get something, run a function to modify it, and then get it again, the second value will be that function applied to the first one. Um, if we're running backwards, that's not true. So if I take the initial state, and then I append this, and then is, and then strange, and then get the final state, what I find is that my final state is empty, and my initial state is this is strange backwards. Uh, absolute nonsense. So it, 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 might, it might look impenetrable. Um, <laughs> is this good, being a, an app title? The, the point to remember is we are basically running the code down to build up the computation of how to run it backwards. So again, to come back to the point of forcing, these prints at the bottom are very strategically placed. Because if I did them after the modify, I wouldn't know the final state yet. And this whole thing would explode and not tell me why. So again, it's, a, it's an extremely, extremely dangerous tool. Um, and this is, this is a bad idea of, of, of how you should use it. Um, so we've done good. We've done bad. So what? What's the ugly? Um, if, that's a, if that's an idea that, that just sort of guarantees your, your coworkers won't talk to you, um, what, what can we do to, to, to really, like, you know, not, not just won't talk to you, but won't sit in the same room, I think, is the sort of the, the last and final goal of this talk. Um, so I, it's, it's, it's been hinted already, but we, we have this power to talk about states that happen in the future and states that happen in the past. And is there a sort of oft maligned language feature that people generally say is a bad idea that we could now bring back now we understand how to reorder computation as and when? And the answer, at least for me, is go to. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> Uh, after we stop and talk about capturing continuation. This, again, is worthy of a talk in itself, so I'm not going to talk too much about shift. If you understand the continuation monad, good for you. Please tell me how it works if you don't. The interesting thing here is at any point I can call shift, and the k here is basically the function from whatever it outputs to the rest of the program. So at this point, I can sort of say, capture everything you were going to do, 
and then feed it David, and then run it again and feed it Eve. And so now, even though I only have one print here, I get two out the top, because I said at this point, I want you to take everything you were going to do and run it twice. So, <laughs> so we, can, we can just decide halfway through computations, I want to stop and save where I am. <laughs> you see where this is going. I, uh, I also included this example. Uh, if, if, you watched, if you saw the first example and thought, yeah, yeah, I get it, um, that little comment at the top is what this program will output. Um, there's, a, there's a little puzzle for you. Uh, yes, write-only code, indeed. Um, not something you should ever see in production. Can't stress enough, because Jesse's here. I have to say, this is not in our code base. <laughs> and you can come work with us, and we'll have a lovely time. Um, so. <laughs> We have a way at any point in our program to say, give me the rest of the program as a function. It's a function. It's a value in Haskell. So we could keep hold of it. We could put it in a map. We could label those particular things in that map. And at other points in the code, we could take things out of that map and run them instead of the code we were going to run. So you, you sort of have this way, as you can see, of go, like you can go to other parts of the code whenever you like. Um, so this is the go to monad. Uh, so the, the interesting thing here is that go to is like a function that does something, a program. And we have a map from strings to those programs. What label says is stop, give me the whole rest of the program as a, as a value, put it in the map, and then carry on. So just mark this place as a jumping point. And what goto says is, stop what you're doing, throw away the rest of the computation, and look up the given tag in that map. And if you find it, run that. So if every time you see a label, you store where you are in the code, and every time you see a goto, you look up where that is in the code, we have goto. We've, we've done it. It's, it's purely functional. It's mathematically sound. It's uh, <laughs> academic, whatever. Um, but there, there is a problem that someone may have noticed. Um, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. So uh, Haskell 2.0, um, we uh, have a new mutable variable. We like mutation now. We've got a 9. And then we establish a label, read it, deprecate it, go to loop, and then you get this output at the top. So it's you know just, just like writing the code we all wish we could. Um, but there's a, there is a problem here, um, which is, you can't jump forward. So if we, if we look back at the definition, go to throws away everything that's going to happen in the future and looks for that tag. So if you haven't seen that tag yet, you'll never see it, because we've said we don't care about that. We're just going to jump to somewhere else. So we can go to as long as we've already seen the label. And so the question becomes, well, we have monad fix. So can we jump to the future? Can we give? the map full of uh, continuation, like label to code mapping, as the input and then generate it as the output and do all the things we've done so far. And then do we have a working go to? And so you type all this in <laughs> giddily on, uh, <laughs> on Sunday night at about 10 PM. And, uh, and you press go. And this is about all I saw, um, because the program hangs forever. Uh, not good. So. <laughs> Why? Why does the program hang? That's the interesting question. And there are a couple of problems here. One is, if I go to a point that I haven't seen yet, I have to look in the map, which means I have to force the value of the map, which means all my laziness collapses, like we said earlier. I've looked at a value too early. I've looked at it before I know what it is. Whole universe explodes. Even if you, couldn't, uh, even if you could avoid that problem, um, for me, there's a more obvious issue as to why you can't do this, which is, let's say this is my program. So I want to jump to test. This means I'm going to jump over the point where I choose a random number. And if it happens to be this one, then that label exists, and otherwise it doesn't. So what, what behavior would we expect if this worked? Like, what, what would good look like? Would we now magically have a value called x, which is? 12,345? Does it not exist? Is it lazy? If we touch it, does the world explode? Don't know. And, uh, and I didn't have time to come up with a better answer than I don't want to know. Um, this, is, uh, this is the kind of generalized problem of monads. 
um, which is that you're allowed to branch, you're allowed to do something effectful, and based on the value you get, do something else. And so in this example, I'm allowed to do some random number generation and then make a decision based on that, which means if I don't do the random number generation, nothing beyond it makes sense in the general case. So monads considered harmful. Um, there are two options here. We either say we have failed and we give up and we go home and we don't write go to and we carry on with our lives. Or we say, monads are the problem here. It's, it's not me, it's the kids. And we say, the, the problem is that monads give us this ability to branch. So can we find another structure in the world that doesn't? And if we know, <laughs> like, we'll come to arrows. Um, and if we can find such a structure, um, a lot of our problems go away, right? We don't have branching, so go to is always a, a well, it's not a total operation, but it's a better looking operation, let's say. So arrows, ask me afterwards. I'll explain why not arrows. Um, we are unfortunately saddled with applicatives. If you have not seen monads, you have definitely not seen applicatives. So this slide will make very little sense. The interesting things are, I have invented this new language with three things, which is go to, label, and print. Why have I done that? Because now I can write something that looks like code, but actually what I get is a list of the instructions. So what I now have is a list of prints, go-tos, and labels. And what I want to do is compile that into prints and go-tos. I can get rid of the labels because they're just points in that list. And actually now I've got that, continuations aren't important because a continuation is just do the thing at that position and the stuff after it until you hit a go-to. Um, so we want to remove some labels. We want to build up this map of label positions, and we want to traverse the list, ideally, once. And at this point, we might have a little bit of deja vu, and we can return to our old friend, uh, compare to average. So this is exactly the code we had before, and um, it, was a, it was a lifetime ago. We were younger and happier then, and if we can remember roughly what it did, we build up the total and count without doing any of the comparisons. Once we have them, we use that to build the average, and then later on, when we care about the comparisons, all this nonsense has already been sorted. So what if we factor out compare and collect? What if we do some good old-fashioned, you know, good software craftspeople refactoring, and we say compare and collect is a, is a function you can pass in arbitrarily, which I'll call f. And the immediate thing is the types get a lot bigger and scarier. <laughs> this will be a theme. And then we say, uh, can we generalize the idea of averages to anything? So rather than caring about total and count, rather than starting with this zero, zero initial state for both, can we just sort of get rid of all that and make that a parameter? And so then we come to something like this. Again, the theme continues. So now we have f, which is the thing that takes the magical value we don't have yet, and something to statefully produce a result, while building up t, which we can, after the fact, translate into that magical s. If you give me an initial t in the x, we get the mr. So this is, I think, the most general I could get it. And then at that point, I said, this is too scary to put on a slide. So what if we just said we don't care about the difference between t and s? Like, a pair of total and count and an average are basically the same thing. So we'll just say they're the same and make it the user's problem. Um, and if you do that, you end up with this function, which is still, granted, quite ugly. Um, but I think what's, what's neat about this for me is what I have here is a function basically from x to r with this magical s going on. And what I get out is a function from x to r without the magical s. So what this function basically does is do the knot tying for you and hide it away. So that in itself is not very interesting, but now it's this general. We can not only use it to build our average, but we can build it to uh, we can use it to build a compiler. Um, I promise we're near the end. No more dense Haskell in like three slides. Um, so if we come into a print, what we're going to do is bump the the line count, which is this this n variable, and we're just going to say this is a print statement. It compiles to print. Move on. If we see a label, we add that label and its position in the list, so that line count thing, to the map, and we delete it. We don't bump the line count, we just say we don't want to keep it. And if we see a go to, we bump the line count, 
and we look up that label. And if we find it, we compile it to go to that index. And if we don't, we blow up, because that's about all we can do. And if you do all this, I promise it works. I have a gist and everything, so it's, it's probably fine. Um, you can then say, well, I can, I can do the compilation, the check function, and then I can write this little interpreter, which says, when I see a go to, update the, the program counter to n and carry on. If I see a print, print the message, bump the program counter, carry on. And if I don't see anything, that means I've like fallen off the end of the list and my program's done. And if you go through all of that fuss, you can write a program where go to works going forward. And finally, finally, after hours and hours of my life that I will never get back, you have written code that should never see the light of day. So the, the, interesting, the interesting thing about this, apart from the fact that we've now fixed Haskell and we've made it a substantially more you know, business-ready language, um, is that it, I, I think it demonstrates really well the, the sort of power of this feature. Not necessarily how you should use it, but the, the power of everything being lazily evaluated and how you can avoid not only very difficult, but also at the time impossible problems if you can sort of sort out the temporal order in which things will appear. The, the problem is, as you've seen, it's incredibly difficult to read. Um, it's also incredibly difficult to write. So I'm not saying it's a great idea, but if you are willing to sacrifice some, some hair, it is, it's an interesting rabbit hole to go down. Um, I am, again, obliged to say we do not use this at my day job. It would never be allowed. I would never keep my day job. So if you want to come along and write some Haskell that doesn't look like this, um, please come talk to me. Uh, and otherwise, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Do we have any <coughs> questions? Do we have any questions? Do you want to ask about arrows? OK, good. Here you go. I'm uh, curious to hear, you were talking about how you have to be really careful with the whole foot gun thing and putting things in the right order so you don't look at things you're not allowed to look at yet because they don't exist. Um, did you find any sort of methodologies for figuring out, can I look at this apart from I look at it and I think really hard? Mm, uh, okay. <laughs> The short answer is no. Um, the, the longer and, I think, more helpful answer is I, I alluded earlier to the fact that everything uh, so far, I, maybe that's fair to say, everything we've found that's kind of a useful application of this, someone's bundled into a library. So for example, we talked about running state backwards. I'm not saying it's a good idea, but if you want to do it, there's a library called reverse state. So you, you never have to worry about any of this. Someone's done it for you. Um, there's even, if you want state that runs in both directions, there's a library called the TARDIS, uh, which is fantastic. You can send things into the future and the past. Um, there are, to my knowledge, two good examples of where this has actually made code more read uh, readable and thousands where it hasn't. But the point is, someone's done all that work and someone's very carefully wired that up and figured out where the knot has to be tied and things. So in general, it is really difficult because Haskell doesn't consider kind of general recursion as, a, as an effect, right? The M in M fix is, is mu. Um, so it doesn't see a problem with you having a function calling itself. It just says that's, that's fine. Um, so it doesn't really have any kind of type facility for helping you here. And so it doesn't help you. It just says, this is, a, this is your problem. This is the mess you made. Uh, just like, I guess another example of this is like 1 divided by 0. It's like. We, we don't consider division to be an effectful operation, so we don't help you when you get it wrong. Um, I guess the difference is when you divide by zero, you get a thing that says error divide by zero. And when you do this, you, you get nothing but an extremely hot laptop. Um, so yes, the, the short answer is if you want to do something, someone's probably done the useful version of it. And if you can't find what you want, Find another way. Write JavaScript. <laughs> cool. Any more questions? I take it as a no. Thank you Good. very much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. I just unplug. Yeah, I just unplug it. Or you let it be. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, in the, I think it was like mid 90s, I learned Visual Basic. I don't know why I learned anything else after this talk. <laughs> 
full circle. It's Every full circle, yeah, man. Everything it's comes full back. circle. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. There's shout out in the in the chat in YouTube saying thanks. Very nice Thank presentation. Yeah. Yes, I mm. hope your mom watched. Yes. You're on TV. Hi, Hi mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, and thanks for tonight for you all on, on the stream. Thank yes. you very much. Yeah, thanks thank again. You. Come. <laughs>